Hey guys, um, I'm super excited to see you. Um, just want to let you guys know that I miss you very, very much, but I'm also super excited for the opportunity to talk to you today as we wrap up our unit on the American Revolution. So if you are in to secrets, espionage, and treason, you have come to the right place. So in this video, I'm going to spill the tea on what happened with the spy ring that saved the revolution. Well, only a little bit of tea. This isn't 1773. Get it? Okay, so we're gonna start at the fall of 1776. Just two months after the Declaration of Independence had been signed, everybody was really excited. Things were going well. The American troops had won some battles. Um, spirits were high. Everybody was really excited about the potential of gaining freedom from England. However, the United States actually lost control of Long Island and Manhattan. And this was a really big deal. Long Island and Manhattan were like the heart of the colonies. So they were kind of central to where everything was happening. And that's why a lot of the major ports and um, harbors were where ships would come in and dock and the colonies would get a lot of their goods and information from those ports of Manhattan and Long Island. So in order to win the American Revolution, it was clear that the U.S. needed to gain and maintain control of Long Island and Manhattan. Now George Washington, he was in charge of the army and he knew, based on prior experience, that a little bit of spying can help. So, as it turned out, Washington actually was a spy in the French and Indian War and knew that he wanted to recruit somebody that he could trust to be a spy in Long Island. So, enter Nathan Hale. Nathan Hale was 21 years old at the time. He was recruited in 1776. In his interview to become the spy for Long Island, um, there were a few, few problems. Nathan Hale had never been to Long Island. He was not familiar with the area at all, but he was young and he was passionate about liberty and freedom for the American people. So Washington agreed to send him to Long Island, but things did not go as planned. We are not sure exactly what happened, when it happened, where it happened, but within a month of Nathan Hale being in Long Island, he was captured, tried, and hung. So, this just made it very, very clear to George Washington that in order to, for this spying situation to be successful in Long Island, he didn't need to send just one person. He knew he would need a team of people. And here is where we meet Benjamin Talmadge. Benjamin Talmadge was actually a friend of Nathan Hale and... He was appointed captain of the Second Continental Light Dragoons, which is a very fun name. So he was appointed ca captain by George Washington himself. And his actual little piece of paper that had his appointment on it was signed by John Hancock, which is really cool. He was appointed also in 1776 and served closely with George Washington from 1776 all the way through 1778. And if you guys remember, the winter of 1777 to 1778 was brutal. It was cold. Um, the troops didn't have a lot of money or supplies. There was some confusion about when troops were getting paid. So morale at that time was really low. So Washington was more pressed than ever to send aspiring to Long Island to maybe get this ball rolling. So when Washington approached Talmadge, somebody that he knew he could trust, in 1778 about creating aspiring and recruiting people who would be willing to spy who were citizens not officers Talmadge agreed Talmadge's first recruit to this super secret spy ring in Long Island was my personal favorite Abraham Woodhull Abraham is my favorite because his story is a little unique Abraham is the youngest of five children he has two older brothers and two older sisters. Now, his family had a lot of money and had an estate in New York. His 
parents basically trained his two older brothers to take over the estate. And because Abraham was the youngest of five, um, they kind of let him do his own thing. So while his brothers were taking classes, learning all these languages and how to be what they needed to be for the estate, um, Abraham was kind of doing his own thing. He was keeping to himself. He did a lot of exploring, a lot of hunting, a lot of fishing. He grew very familiar with the area and the land, and he knew how to take care of himself. In a strange turn of events, his two older brothers ended up passing away, and then he was kind of forced to become head of the estate. Abraham trying to think of ways where he could make a positive impact for the American people. So what he ended up doing was actually smuggling goods from ports in Long Island and Manhattan to his town and his estate and selling them to people because whenever the British gained control of those areas, they weren't getting access to those things like meats or um, spices, paper, things like that. They were hard to come by or they were more expensive because you were having to buy them from the British. So Abraham ended up smuggling a lot of those goods to help the American people. When Townsend first approached him, he was a little bit nervous, um, and he continues to be nervous throughout the entire remainder of their time in the spiring, but Abraham Whittle was given the authority to help recruit other members to the spiring, and his very first recruit was Caleb Brewster. Caleb Brewster was a talented sailor. He also was very familiar with waterways and smuggled goods. The next person to join the team was Austin Rowe who was a tavern keeper. They were a little bit nervous about Austin joining the team because Austin had a family, um, business, and a lot more to lose if this went wrong. Um, but Austin was insistent. He was super excited. He really wanted to be a part of the team. So he ended up becoming a vital player in the spy rank. So in order to keep this information confidential and to be effective spies, they came up with code names. So since Woodhull and Talmadge were mainly the people that were going to be sending letters back and forth to each other, Talmadge got the code name John Bolton, and then Woodhull got the code name Samuel Culper. And this is how we get the name the Culper Six. But in sending information from one place to the next, in passing letters from Woodhull to Brewster to Rowe to back to Brewster who would take it, Talmadge, Talmadge take it to Washington. The whole process from start to finish took two weeks. That needed a little bit of refinement, but it was still less risky than having one person trying to get information from one place to the next. Having a team of people passing along information, um, you were less likely to get caught. Another way that they protected their information, this happened a little bit later into the war, but they started writing with invisible ink. Um, there's a funny story, well it's not really funny, but a story about Woodhull. Like I mentioned earlier, he was a little bit apprehensive. And at some point during the war, um, Woodhull had the great privilege of quartering British soldiers, which was fabulous for a spy. And it has been said that Woodhull would be writing his letters to Talmadge in Washington with British soldiers either right next door or right down the hall. And so there's a story of like one night where it was stormy outside, of course, and um, he is writing his letter in invisible ink and he hears footsteps coming down the hall to a study and he panics and, he, but he's writing his letter in invisible ink so anybody could look at it and not be able to read it. But he starts throwing things in the fire and he gets so scared and like jumps up and whenever the door opens, he jumps up and the invisible ink spills all on the floor. And it was just his nieces coming in to study. <laughs> it's not British soldiers. So it was clear after that moment that Woodhull needed a little bit of a break and needed somebody to kind of help take the pressure off. So then Woodhull recruited Robert Townsend in 1779. Robert Townsend was valuable because he was a shop owner at the docks in Long Island. So he was able to inspect a lot of ships that were coming in and there was a lot of people in and out of his shops. 
So whenever he was recruited and joined the team, he was given the name, the nickname for his code, Samuel Culper Jr. Also, right down the street from his coffee shop, James Rivington, who was an expatriate, his coffee shop was right down the street. And this was really important because a lot of higher up British people went and hung out at the coffee shop all the time. And there was also one person in particular that was there a lot. And his name was Major John Andres. And he was a loyalist. And he hung out there all the time. Like, I don't know when he ever worked because he was there all the time. But Townsend was smart. Um, at the beginning, he was nervous about people noticing that he was asking a lot of questions and kind of out of character for him because he mostly kept to himself. Um, so whenever James Rivington opened his coffee shop and then decided that he was going to make his own newspaper, Robert Townsend um, applied to be able to write a column for the paper. And of course, James Rivington said yes, and it was the perfect cover for Robert Townsend to ask questions. And so he was also at the coffee shop a lot and also asked a lot of questions with people coming in and out of his shop and regular customers that he saw all the time. The spy ring, one of their major, major, major successes was helping the French get to the United States to help the Americans win the war. Um, there was a lot of anxiety about them being able to dock safely and not be ambushed by the British. And the spy ring was able to learn of the plan that the British had to ambush the French before they had even docked safely, basically make them turn around and go back. And so they were able to pass that information along to Washington. And Washington was able to come up with a plan for the French to dock somewhere else and to safely get to the United States. And that was one of the major victories for the spy ring because the French, without the French's help, we would not be... The United States of America. Now, we have been talking about the Culper Six, but I've only told you about five members of the team. There's one person that we have not talked about, and her name, as we know, is Agent 355. She was somehow associated with Robert Townsend. Um, we don't know what her name is. We don't know what her identity is. In his letters, Townsend only referred to her as the lady or Agent 355. But we know that she was one of the major people to help the spy ring foil Benedict Arnold's plan. So, basically, what had happened was Benedict Arnold had gained a high position in West Point at that, that base there. And had basically promised the British that because... He was an American soldier and he was in charge of this area that if they came at this time, they would be able to take over. Um, and he had also recruited Major John Andres, which was basically his contact with the British, to pose as an American soldier and come and help usher in the British troops. Um, and because of Agent 355 and James Remington's lovely coffee shop, they were able to foil the plan and let George Washington and Talmadge know what was going on before it happened. And George Washington actually was able to arrive at West Point before the British were scheduled to be there, before he was even scheduled to be there. And Benedict Arnold, unfortunately, escaped at that moment. Preventing the British from taking over West Point was a huge deal and was key for them gain regaining control of Manhattan and Long Island. So... I hope you have enjoyed this video about the American Revolution and the Culper Six and how important they were to us becoming Americans. And so, I hope to see you guys soon. If you have any questions, just let me know. Bye, guys. Hey, guys. <laughs> Talmadge. The winter of 17. Long Island. <laughs> and <clears throat> he. And in.